let's go into the word of God. Ezra, Ezra, the book of Ezra, after Second Chronicles, just before Nehemiah. The book of Ezra, chapter 3. Tonight, I want to just share a word that I believe is a word for this season that the body of Christ is in. Ezra chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. We're going to skip around a little bit for time's sake. Verses 7 and 8, then verse 10 through 13, and then one, uh, a couple correlating scriptures from the New Testament, if you don't mind. And when the seventh month was come, the children of Israel in the cities were in the cities. The people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. They gathered themselves together as what? One man, one man to Jerusalem. And then stood up Jeshua the son of Josedach and his brethren the priests, and Zerubbabel the son of Shetiel and his brethren, and built the altar of God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And they set the altar upon his basis, and for and fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. Verse 7 and 8, uh, I'll put them together. Those other verses are important, but time's sake here. They gave money also unto the masons and to the carpenters, and meat and drink and oil. And unto them of Zidon, and to them of Tyre, to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea of Joppa, according to the grant that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now in the second year of their coming unto the house of God in Jerusalem in the second month, began Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, and Jeshua, the son of Zerubbabel, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites. All, and all they that will come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem and appointed Levites from 20 years old and upward. Uh, from how old? 20 years old and upward. To set forward, to set forward, to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Uh, to set forward the house, work of the house of the Lord. Then concluding verses 10 through 13. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sung together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever towards Israel. And all the people shout with a great shout when they praise the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites, chief of the fathers, who were ancient men that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy. So that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. Just a couple of quick correlating scriptures to tie. Uh, most, some people don't like us just to preach from the Old Testament, so let me give you <laughs> a little New Testament in here as well that will uh, be congruent and correlate with what we're sharing tonight. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Verses 34 and 35. Acts chapter 10. Verses 34 and 35. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him. In every nation, he that feareth him. And worketh righteousness. Is accepted with him. Get right it, just read it. Every nation. He that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. And lastly, one final correlating text, Colossians 1, familiar te text, Colossians 1, verses 26 through 28. Colossians 1, 26 through 28. 
even the mysteries which have been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to the saints, to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the greatest, what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. I'm going to preach tonight from Ezra chapter 3 primarily, tying those New Testament texts and some others perhaps as we go along to convey to you the thought that I hope that you would never forget because it's a spiritual responsibility. And I speak to you tonight as an apostolic strategist who has some anointing like the sons of Issachar, who had an understanding of the times and knew what it was that Israel ought to do. And they had courage to do it. They had influence to do it because the Bible says they had 200 brethren and they were all under their command. <laughs> this is a season to stand in spiritual authority. Yeah, understand your sphere of spiritual influence. Yeah, and occupy until he comes. Hallelujah. Tonight I want to preach from the subject, Redeeming Zion's Children. Say it with me. Redeeming Zion's Children. Redeeming Zion's Children. Redeeming Zion's Children. And as much as we are tonight have earmarked 25 years and 40 years respectively for the ministry and the fellowship Tonight, I want to see if I can also tie into this strategies for transgenerational ministry. Strategies for transgenerational ministries, which would, by the way, cause you to have an unusual future. <laughs> How many are ready for an unusual future? A future that you cannot predict. A future that the enemy tries to snuff out and keep you away from, but you know it's inevitable because the Lord had already ordained it. Okay, okay. Uh, let me let me find twelve people to preach to tonight. I, <laughs> uh, I'm like Jesus. If I can preach to twelve, I'll be all right. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Redeeming uh, Zion's children. Redeeming Zion's children. Our country, our world, is in great turmoil, as you well know. Uh, and listen every day. There's always something going on to uh, for us to pray about in our families, in our communities, our cities, our state, our country, the world. Last week, you probably were amazed as I was, as 51, almost 52% of, of uh, England, Great Britain, chose to pull out of the European Union. In two days, uh, the market leaked over $2 trillion, lost over $2 trillion worldwide. That's significant, it's quite significant. I was preaching last week in uh, uh, Orlando, Florida, and uh, where I was preaching was about six to seven minutes away from the Pulse, the place where uh, a few weeks ago the gentleman goes in and kills 49 people and wounds scores of others. There's great turmoil in our country, in our world. <laughs> uh, we're, we're constantly looking out and, and fearful about terrorism all over. You're close to New York City. You were, you were close to this point back in 2001 when it happened. And ever since then, we've been on the alert, watching what's gonna happen. But the greatest part about all of this is that none of it surprises Jesus. <laughs> God is not at, uh, at all surprised about what's happening around us. And listen to this, some of the saints of the Lord are not surprised either. And one of the things that we must be concerned about in, as we listen to and, and uh, inevitably become a part of what's going on is not to allow it to disrupt our peace. And I will keep you in perfect peace, whose mind is, come on, I, I, I know y'all know some word because you got a word preacher here. Praise the name of the Lord. So I'm going to look for you to fill in the blank tonight. Help me out. <laughs> That, that'll save me 30 seconds, perhaps. Praise the name of the Lord. Uh, so tonight, I, I want to use a, a spiritual paradigm from the Old Testament to relate to the contemporary place where we find ourselves in our community, in our cities, in our country, in our world. 
And I hope you will allow me tonight to connect the dots so that you can find this word of the Lord quite relevant. Uh -huh. Let me go right into it for time's sake. I've got to get right into it. As we read Ezra chapter 3, the year is 537 B.C. The place is Jerusalem. Jerusalem is interpreted in its etymology as set for double peace. I want somebody to prophesy that night. My life has been set for double peace. Double peace. Man, if you want to bear witness, it's about two immutable things by which God cannot lie that when he swears, he swears once in the heaven and once in the earth. Are y'all still here? <laughs> so peace in heaven and peace in earth. And sometimes the reason you don't have peace in earth is because you have not made peace in heaven. I, I, I really feel like preaching already. <laughs> set for double peace. Come on, prophesy that again. My life has been set for double peace. Yeah, 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 yeah. Double peace. And that's the name of the city. That's the etymology of the word Jerusalem, the city that we're talking about tonight. And tonight when I talk about Zion, I'm going to be speaking of the city of Jerusalem and its people, its inhabitants. Uh -huh. As frequently it was called Zion in the prophetic books of your Bible. So let me just explain Zion now. Zion is the city, but Zion is also the children of the city. The inhabitants of the city, the generations born in the city, those who have been marked by God to be inhabitants of the city, whether they're there now or not. Okay, Lord help us, I feel, I'm starting to feel like preaching already. <laughs> in this text, the Jews had just been permitted to return back to Jerusalem after 70 years of being held captive in Babylon. Cyrus was in his first year reigning as king of Persia. <laughs> and sometime in order to change your future and get you back to where God wants you, God has to change rulership in the earth. So it doesn't matter if it's going to be Hillary or it's going to be Donald. In the next few years, the saints will be praying. Okay, y'all. <laughs> okay, I see you're not ready for me. Praise the name of the Lord. Uh, I, I, are you hearing me? Because, because the Lord set Cyrus there for his people. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, and some things God is orchestrating is for the benefit of those who love him. Uh -huh. Some 70 years had gone by. And, and, and as part of God's judgment, he had led them into captivity for generation upon generation of disobedience. Nah, uh -huh. many of us are bear witness that just a perpetual disobedience can cut you off from the blessings of the Lord, which are supposed to make you rich and add no sorrow. Come on, but this is not a season for perpetual disobedience. Remind your neighbor, this is your season to obey God and to obey him willingly. Come on, talk to me. No more coercion to obey God. No more arm twisting to obey God. Come on, I need some help up in here. Hallelujah. I should not have argued my point and, 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 and threaten you for you to obey God. Now you need to obey God willingly. For it's those who are willing and obedient. They shall eat the good of the... I know you know some word. Come on here. Come on in here. They can eat some good of the land. Said, I tell you, name, I'm going to need something better. Oh, something better, something better. And I'm not talking about your diet, your natural diet, obviously. I'm talking about your spiritual well-being. God, I feel like preaching you. <laughs> so, stay with me if you don't mind. Uh, now at last, Cyrus had engaged the desire, the will of the Lord, that the time of captivity be over. Who can I preach tonight? who believe that your time of bondage, your time of captivity is over. I've learned my lesson. I've been a good student. Come on, talk to me. And that's a lesson I don't have to repeat again. Hallelujah. So my time of captivity is over. I feel like preaching. I'm now ready for the next move of God in my life. And God does not have to punish me any longer. Even, for, listen to this, even for the disobedience of my fathers. Shabbat, it will come on your side. Hallelujah. Because now I'm walking in a place where the curse of my fathers are no longer unnuring to me. I'm walking in a consciousness that those things have been broken off my life. And I've got freedom in Jesus. Who 
can I preach to tonight? When you testify with me, I got freedom in Jesus. Hallelujah, I got freedom in Jesus. And the devil doesn't like it, but I'm free. Praise God, I'm free. No longer bound, no more chains holding me. My soul is resting. It's just a blessing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. And he who in the sun sets free is free in me. <laughs> they had been liberated to return to Jerusalem. They had been liberated to return to Jerusalem. Uh, and it was, I wish I had time to go back to chapters one and two, but don't have time to do it. And they set a system in place for those who were willing to volunteer to go back to Jerusalem. Took a roll call, did some record checking, checking the archives of who was who. Y'all know that story back in chapter two. Hallelujah. Trying to see if your name was written there or not. God, that's a, that's a whole other sermon. Is your name written there? Do you have a right to go back to Jerusalem? Lord have mercy. That's a whole other sermon altogether. But there's a little bit of dilemma, even emotionally, about returning to Jerusalem. Let me tell you what the little bit of dilemma is because the Lord had allowed Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29, one of the texts you love so very much. Uh, verses 9 through perhaps 13, somewhere in there. The Lord had not allowed Jeremiah pre-captivity to prophesy to this group and say to them, though you're going into bondage, I'm not going to leave you there forever. I'm going to come back and get you and bring you, he said, to this place. Jesus, help me tonight. I'm going to bring you to this place. <laughs> and, and you know, we, we like to end up in verses of 11, I know the thoughts that I have towards you. But that's a dangerous text because when that was prophesied, it was prophesied to a people going into bondage for 70 years. So you be careful how you let people prophesy you to you using that text. Maybe they're telling you that you're about to go into bondage and your freedom will uh, come after your 70 years of troubles. Okay. <laughs> but the Lord told them when you get down into to Babylon now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to build houses. I want you to get married. I want you to have children. I want you to plant gardens. I want you to grow stuff. I want you to have relationships in your community. And the problem with coming back to Jerusalem in Ezra is that they were faring so well in Babylon. Y'all not going to talk to me in here. How do I give up what I'm experiencing and enjoying in Babylon and come back to Jerusalem, which is a ruined place? I feel like preaching. <laughs> it's like asking some of you to go back to where you lived in your childhood and give up where you're living now. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be very happy about that. Lord have mercy. I lived in a, in a two bedroom house with, with five of us and you can look through the floor and, and see the, the chickens walking under the house, under the house. Y'all not gonna talk to me. <laughs> we will put rags in the floor to keep the water and keep the air from coming up through the floor. Come on, in the winter time and take the rags out in the summer time because we needed that air. That was called our air conditioning system. <laughs> Shama, hallelujah. Now you're going to ask me to go back to that after enjoying what I'm enjoying now? Well, that's the context in which these children of Zion found themselves. Lord have mercy. Going back to Jerusalem after having lived in Babylon, and Jerusalem is in ruins. Jerusalem is in ruins. <laughs> hallelujah. My God Almighty. The Lord had been torn down. The buildings were looted. And worst of all, the temple that Solomon had built 500 years prior to this time, hallelujah, where it was gone, it was vanished, it was utterly destroyed. Hallelujah. Uh, just a recall of the temple was seemingly like a bad dream or a nightmare. My God. The Babylonians had taken all of their gold, had taken all of their silver, thanks to Hezekiah. Come on, talk to me. I went upon a visit into Jerusalem. Hezekiah was boasting about his gold and silver and risked showing the king of Babylon where his gold and silver was. My God Almighty, tell your neighbor you cannot share with the enemy your precious stuff. I feel like preaching. Lord, you gotta be careful how you share with the enemy. Come on, those things to you that are precious. He might not take them right then and there, but he's gonna be back to see if he can get it from you when you're unaware. 
Can I preach to somebody? Let me find 12 people to preach to. Please, I, I'm begging, I'm begging. I'm begging for somebody to preach to. Lord, I'm begging. My God, I'm begging. <laughs> Who shall I buy? Call the mindset. Hallelujah. I'm going to hurry up. I'm going to hurry up. My God Almighty. So by the time we get to this text here in chapter 3, the Bible says that the remnant who had left Babylon and were coming back leading the return to Jerusalem or Zion as we're referring to it, had settled in the homesteads of their fathers. A likely place to come back to where your fathers were when they lived here. There's a danger, however, in settling where your father settled. Y'all right. ain't gonna help me preach. Lord have mercy. <laughs> I just preach to somebody down the road and say, neighbor, be careful uh, of where you settle. Uh, your fathers, when they settled there, went from there to captivity. So you don't want to settle in the place where your fathers went into captivity from. So we get to verse 1 now. Verse 1, <laughs> where now uh, Zerubbabel and Jeshua summons them from their homesteads. Summons them from their homesteads back to Jerusalem. <laughs> Come from the surrounding areas back to the city. Good God Almighty, I feel, I'm feeling something in here already. He who, uh, it was in December, the month of Tishrai. The month of Tishrai, not July, the seventh month of the Jewish calendar, Tishrai. That's the month when we celebrate Yom Kippur. Yah, Yah, Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Tabernacles. So it was a month of glory. <laughs> Lord have mercy. God moved on his people in a month of great glory. Okay, okay. <laughs> and he said, come out from your home place and come back to Jerusalem, the center city. And the Bible says here, they came as one man. They came as one man. Somebody said one man. Hallelujah. And that wasn't to ensure, the strategy there was to ensure that there was a unity. There was oneness. <laughs> uh, may I even stretch and say, there, there make sure there's harmony. Come on, <laughs> uh, are y'all still here? They came as one man because there is power in oneness. I wish I could help somebody. Now you gotta understand what's going on here. I'm a preacher and a teacher, so stay right with me. You gotta understand what's going on here. It's been 70 years. It's been 70 years. And using the number 20, 20 years, as a generation, uh -huh, there were how many generations returning? Three and a half. Y'all still here? Yeah, 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 so 20, 75 by 20 is three and a half, right? Three and a half generations returning from Babylon back to Jerusalem. Come on, stay with me, stay with me. Which means unequivocally, some of them were born in Zion. Some of them were born in Babylon. Come on, talk to me. And undoubtedly, some of them were born in transition. In a place between Babylon and Zion. Man, I feel like preaching. Lord have mercy. Uh -huh. and, 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 but, the, but the situation here, Elder, Elder, uh, it, it, it's not, it's not so much where they were born. It's the fact that they were all Zion's children. Let me preach to somebody. Who were they? They were all Zion's children. Whether they were born in Jerusalem or whether they were born in Babylon or in some place in between. There was still, come on, help me, Zion's children. Hallelujah. And the Lord loves his children. I feel that preaching. And he will not neglect them or forsake them forever. I, can I preach to somebody tonight? Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, God. And, and after 70 years, perhaps, uh, in the natural sense, we will forget those faces, forget those scenarios. Come on. But not God. God says, I'm going to bring you back to the place where you were. I feel like preaching. <laughs> I want you to understand some things here. There is a tremendous difference between those who are 70 and those who are 4, 5, 10, 15 years old. Come on, talk to me. But they were all Zion's children. Lord have mercy. And I'm going to make sure you understand that as we go. Hallelujah. But they came together as one. As one. No matter where they were born, they came together as one. Come on, talk to me. Which means they had some cultural differences. 
differences in their backgrounds, but they came together as one. The educational systems were undoubtedly different, but they came together as one. Their last names were not the same, but they came together as one. Y'all will help me preach it here. Uh, I would not doubt that there were different hues and different colors, but they came together as one. And there's a clarion call that I believe the Lord has for us in this season is that he wants to make us one. Y'all will help me preach. Till John 17, one of the last prior prayers that Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 is Father. Make them one, even as you and I are one. Make them one in us. I wish I could preach to somebody tonight. Put it in the atmosphere, Lord. Make us one. I'm gonna throw you a little bit of a curveball that might become a little caveat in your theology, and, and that's okay. Search it out if you want to. But 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 our oneness, our oneness among ourselves has been hindered because we don't understand that we're one with Him. We're trying to make, we're trying to make ourselves one horizontally before we become one vertically. Right. Y'all ain't gonna help me talk to you. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, the horizontal oneness is made easier when you first ver uh, express or appreciate your vertical oneness with him. Come on, are y'all still here? One with him, one with him. My God, John 7, John 14. <laughs> I'm gonna go away, but I'm not gonna leave you. I'm gonna send a comforter. I'm gonna send a comforter. He's gonna be the spirit of truth. Come on, talk to me. And he shall not leave you comfortless. I'm just jumping through there. Are y'all still here? He shall not leave you comfortless. Good God Almighty. Which means he's not gonna leave you like an orphan. He, come on. <laughs> he's not gonna leave you like a fatherless child. A place that's homeless, no place to go. Let me preach this to the little group over here. My God Almighty. Here. Hallelujah. And look what he says. In that day, in that day, you will know that I am in the Father. You are in me, and I'm in you. <laughs> Lord, y'all still okay? <laughs> Not the outside numbers. You, there's nothing the enemy can do once we become one to divide us. Y'all will help me preach. Oh my God. Behold how good and how perfect it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. In unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that falls down to the beard, even Aaron's beard, unto the skirts of his garment. It's like the mountain, it's like the, the, the mountain, uh, uh, the dew upon the mountain that goes down from Hebron down to Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing. And life evermore. Come on, y'all still here? <laughs> to the power of unity. Let me rush. Let me rush. And then the Bible says, and, and, and if, I, if I can dub for a moment that first verse I just read to you, there's two things I want you to note there. Ah, help me. Oh, God, I hope you can handle this. First of all, I want you to note the strategy to return. Uh, uh, Solomon, not Solomon, I'm sorry. Cyrus has set for them a strategy to return. Come on. So there's got to be a, a strategy preparing for the return of those who are in captivity back to Zion. Good God Almighty. What are you going to do when they come? I'll preach it in a minute. <laughs> Hallelujah. The second thing I want you to see there is that the strategy is assisted by another strategy called reconciliation. <laughs> oh Lord, reconciliation. Why? Why is that important? Because because when they come, they cannot be divided. When they come back to uh, deliverance, Jesus is coming. Huh, you cannot suddenly have two or three churches. They've got to find the wherewithal to fit within the context of the one church. Lord, I feel like preaching. Hallelujah! Because God is about to redeem Zion's children. Lord have mercy. <laughs> oh, Lord. If you're back there and you're hearing me, just raise your hand. Just, it, it, if you know what I mean, if you're really hearing me with your spiritual ear, my God Almighty. Uh -huh. So there's also two strategies I don't want to forget. One was a strategy for return, for the house has to prepare for the return. And the second is a strategy of reconciliation, <laughs> where we were to resolve our differences. I may not like the reason you left, but you're welcome back. Good God 
Almighty. Man. Okay. The next thing they do down in verses 2 and 3. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> the Bible says they rebuild the altar. Put that in the atmosphere. Rebuild the altar. Which means they set a strategy for revival. <laughs> if you're going to come back to Jerusalem, you will come back to Zion after having been in battle for 70 years. Huh? You have been tainted by altars that were not of God. <laughs> so we need to introduce you to the genuine altar of God. As a matter of fact, they called for the altar the way that Moses had built it. Oh, y'all still here? It's right in the text. <laughs> they wanted to, they wanted to rebuild the altar like Moses has built it. <laughs> My problem today with many of us who build churches, rebuild, reconstruct buildings and, and have churches, is that we have reason to remove the altar. And we deal, as it were, with the virtual altar. And I'm not criticizing that. Perhaps there's nothing wrong with that. Hallelujah. But sometimes that little piece of furniture would remind us of the need to come to what we used to call the mourner's bench <laughs> and find reconciliation for your soul. And they rebuilt the altar, calling for a time of revival. This was a commitment to rededicate themselves to God. Lord, uh, if there's something I want to get you ready for in the return or the redeeming of Zion's children, we must allow place for them to get back to God. And y'all know what he'll make. Hallelujah. Because the altar is a sign of relationship. That's where you come into relationship with the Lord. Any of us who've had perpetual relationship with God have found ourselves continually at an altar. Y'all never hear me preach. It may be your steering wheel, but it was the altar for the moment. Come on, talk to me. It may be the computer where you sit behind working, but it was the altar for the moment. My God Almighty. Hallelujah. Because relationship with God is ascertained in the face of God. And God's got a way of meeting his people at the altar. Who shall I? Okay. Hallelujah. The altar is a place of worship. Hallelujah. The altar is a place of worship. Uh -huh. Because it's where you come and make your sacrifices unto the Lord. It's where they offer the peace offering. Come on, the trespass offering. Y'all don't know that. I go, yeah. Hallelujah. And now, I like what Hebrews said. Now we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Hallelujah. That we might obtain help and find grace in the time of need. Come on, anybody ever been to the altar recently? Your back to me to the altar. Your shower in the morning. Come on, talk to me. Build an altar in the shower. Have the Lord meet you right there, right then and there. Set your day, order your day. Command your day from the altar. I feel like preaching. Remind your name and say, I know it then. You got to command your morning. Command it, command it, command it, command it your morning. Yeah. Hallelujah. Aye, 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 aye. I, I, I'm going, I'm going fast. I'm going fast. The problem with virtual altars that I have seen over the years that I've been doing what I do huh, is that frequently there are altars that do not alter. Okay. <laughs> there are A-L-T-A-R-S that do not A-L-T-E-R-S. Are y'all still here? Altars that don't alter. Don't tell me you've been praying and nothing is happening. Don't come and talk to me. Don't tell me you've been in the face of God and you remain the same. For some reason, your altar isn't altering you. I feel like preaching. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, if you're going to build an altar, you'll run unto the Lord that will alter you. It'll change your attitude. It'll change your disposition. It'll change the desires of your heart. I need to talk to somebody. It'll change your ways. It'll change your character. It will modify your integrity. I feel like preaching. Oh. I shall not come. Son, you're going to kill an old man. <laughs> uh, Y'all still here? I'm really rushing. I'm really rushing because I, I got to get out of here and you got to get out of here. Uh -huh. So that, that strategy there was the strategy of revival, rebuilding the altar. Let me go jump down to my next 
scripture I'll read for you, seven and eight. Seven said they gave money and also masons and to, and to the carpenters and meat and drink, oil and, and, and trees and trees from Lebanon uh -huh. and a grant and a grant. Seven, the strategy of seven, Bishop, is a strategy uh, of resources. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because in this, if we're going to prepare for the return, we, we got to have resources and make sure we can co convene them, we can we can house them, we can facilitate them. Lord, are y'all still here? And, and the Bible says that in this coming back, they were blessed. They were blessed with resources. And somebody said resources. And there's one thing that has hindered the work of the Lord in many of our apostolic Pentecostal holiness, uh, 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 charismatic, uh, uh, neo-charismatic churches is the lack of resources. Y'all not gonna help me, my God Almighty. We have not been able to do all the things we want to do because we haven't always had the resources. But I come to tell somebody tonight, God is about to release in your life resources. You won't believe me, and I'm not going to try to persuade you. But I hear from the Lord tonight, I'm going to give you resources. If you believe it, prophesy to somebody else around you who might believe it also. There's a release of resources. Somebody say to me, there's a release of resources. My God Almighty. The Bible says that here, and look at what it says. He gave money. They gave money. See, resources are not just money, but it is money. Money. Uh huh. Workers, masons, and carpenters. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Meat and drink. Oil. Are oh, y'all looking at Saint Paul in verse seven? Uh huh. Trees, which is construction material. I feel like preaching. <laughs> My God Almighty. Hallelujah. And listen to the last thing it said. And a grant from Cyrus. So my prophets out here, they but grants from Cyrus. And the good thing about grants is you don't have to pay them back. I feel like preaching. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, the Lord has not released the resources in your life that you will not have to pay it back. I'm not talking about low interest. I'm talking about no interest. I'm talking about no repayment. The Lord is about to anoint you with resources. Touch somebody around you and say, You must have more than enough. God will bless you until you're blessing to somebody else. because I'm not afraid of you. Pray with me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh -huh. Because look what happens here. Uh, by the time we get almost to the text here, uh, talking about the priests and the Levites who returned from their captivity in Jerusalem, which means there were some priests and Levites 
listen to this, even some prophets in captivity. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Jeremiah was in captivity. Ezekiel was in captivity. Are y'all still here? Good God Almighty. Uh -huh. and just because sometimes you're, you're capable of preaching and teaching the word don't mean you're free. Okay. But when we get to verse 8, when we get to verse 8, here's what happens. Uh -huh. The Bible says they change some rules. <laughs> to facilitate those who are returning from Babylon. Man, this is gonna hurt for a moment, but hold your breath and just before a minute, it's just like the hypodermic. <laughs> just a little pinch is all it's gonna be. Uh, they change some rules in order to facilitate uh, their purpose, the task for which they are returning for. They have an assignment. Their assignment is to get this foundation relayed so that ultimately they can rebuild the house of God. Uh, uh, Y'all still here? Yes. Am I right about that so far? Uh, look what they do. Jes Jeshua and Zerubbabel chooses to lower the age that qualifies one to become a servant in the house of God, a Levite. Right. Back in Numbers chapter 8, the number, the age for a servant or a Levite was 25. For a priest it was 30. Come on, y'all still here? <laughs> That's why you understand that Jesus could not enter into his ministry until age 30 because he was operating under the Jewish law. Come, come on, talk to me, somebody. I need some help over here now. <laughs> but Levites could start serving at 25. But because of a sense of urgency and the need, and it's written right there, to move the work of the Lord forward, they lowered the age. From 25 to 20, I feel like preaching. Which means that some of us in this season, if we're gonna have some movement in the church, forward. Come on, talk to me. We gotta look at some of our rules we've been using. Lord, <laughs> and you can't wait for people to get 40 and 50 years old before you start ordaining them. Okay, Lord have mercy. <laughs> if there's a major concern that the church has at large, and I specifically have, because of, of a number of years I've studied this, is, is for the millennials. The millennials. Millennials are those who were born, according to uh, George Barner in the Barner Report, or, or the Pew Report out of D.C., say the millennials are those who were born between 1980 and 2000. Barner even puts it up to 2003. Uh -huh. But somewhere between 1980 and 2000, 2003, is a group called millennials. Come on, y'all still here? They follow the generation Xers. Come on, come on. Follow, who followed me as a baby boomer. Uh -huh. I'm a baby boomer, and some of you all are too. Uh, are y'all still here? Okay. Now, now listen, listen to this, what happens here. They, they choose to lower the age because of the necessity, this sense of urgency at hand of getting the work done. Uh -huh. Because if you've got all of these old folk around you, you're going to have seasonality. You're going to have, come on, talk to wisdom. But you're not going to have much strength. Right. Ain't nobody going to help me. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I called the young because they were strong. But I haven't gotten rid of the old ones because they know the way. Come on, talk to me. <laughs> and you got to understand something here. And I'm, I'm, I'm about to bring this down. And I, I, I'll finish in a moment here. <laughs> Understand the message of Jesus oh, back in Matthew chapter 9. <laughs> you, 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 you cannot keep forcing new wine into old bottles. Come on, talk to me. <laughs> if, if, if you got a new revelation, if there's new wine, you cannot keep handing it over to old bottles. Are y'all still here? <laughs> Do I have to come out and sit next to you to preach to you? <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh -huh. But the Bible says that's not wise to do. He said, if you got new wine, put it in what? New bottles or new wine skins, some translations say. My God, skins that have been made ready for that which have to undergo the power. Oh, God. And, and, and the strength of fermentation. Because old wine is already fermented. Come on, talk to me. Hallelujah. But new wine has to go through fermentation. And, and that can be violent. God Almighty. So don't put new wine in old bottles. Put it in new bottles. Uh -huh. and, he said, and here's what you do when you do that. Leave the old to the old and put the new in the new. And you will both preserve them both. That they both may be preserved. I'm in the book 
in case you didn't know. Hallelujah. So they're coming a time when some of these changes will not fit the old group. But you've got to be courageous enough to change them or to make them. I'm preaching the wrong word now. you got to be courageous enough to make them. Lord have mercy. Because there is some new wine skins out there ready for new wine. And they cannot handle the same old stuff that you and I handle as being seniors in the house. we got to get ready for an emerging generation. This is the place where I violate some rules of homiletics. Because some say you cannot... You should not contemporize the text. I choose to disagree. I think the text is, is a, law, a, a validation until you do contemporize it. Lord have mercy. Bring it home to me today. <laughs> Let me bring this text home to you. The Bible says they increase, decrease the age from 25 to 20. Uh, that was by definition of today. These were millennials. These were their millennials. Our millennials are 20 some years old for the most part. As a matter of fact, you read some report they call them 20 somethingers. This is the group that does not like church the way we do it. These are the groups that statisticians call nuns and duns. You ask them what is their religious affiliation? They say none. Come on, talk to me. Do you go to church? No, I'm done. Come on, talk to me. They don't mean they're done with Jesus. They're done with church like we do it. They're in the sick home and watch it by streaming it and watching it on television. Then they put up with the foolishness that goes on when they gather together. Y'all ain't gonna help me preach in here. I, I'm okay, I'm okay. I am okay. I know who I serve. And we've almost lost them in our churches. Y'all need help me. We've almost lost them. Children you prayed for. Children you christened. Children you baptized. Children you taught in Sunday school. Y'all are going to talk to me. Children who sang on our choirs. You, I feel like preaching. And now you can't find them. You don't know where they are. And when you see them, they're not going to anybody's church. But the Lord told me to tell you, they're about to return. I feel like preaching. And whether they, they were born, many of them, either in transition between Zion and Babylon, yeah. and many of them were born in Babylon. Yeah. Lord have mercy. And Babylon has a unique culture. Yeah. <laughs> Babylon worships many gods. Yeah. Babylon builds groves with altars yeah. to various and sundry gods. Yeah. Are y'all still here? This is their environment where they were raised. Talk to me. This is where, if they were born in Babylon, that's all they know. I need some help. <laughs> Babylon educates her children, uh, and the great God Jehovah may not be part of the education. Can, I, I'm, I'm almost gone. I'm almost finished here. Are y'all still here? Uh, so these are children that are coming back to Zion who are not familiar. <laughs> with the spiritual culture of Zion. Good God Almighty. And unfortunately, when they come back, we look for them to fit in and understand our songs and our litanies and our liturgies and why we're doing this like that. Lord have mercy. <laughs> I'm uh, <you're> okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the truth of the matter, they're examining it and said, that makes no sense. Good God Almighty. Uh -huh. But don't, don't write them off yet. Don't write them off yet. Uh -huh. These are your children. These are your children uh -huh. who have picked up some Babylonian culture. Babylon allows the men and the women to wear earrings in Babylon. Come on, talk to me. Uh -huh. Come on, my. Uh -huh. In Babylon, the men and the women wear earrings all around their ears. Everyone, everyone, all around. Come on, are y'all still here? That's what they do in Babylon. I said, that's what they do in Babylon. Uh -huh. Uh 
uh, battling in battle they put earrings in their eyelashes. I'm talking about your son, your daughter, your niece, your nephew. Come on, your cousin, your uncle, your aunt. I'm talking about it. Uh -huh. they, they put in, uh, rings in their noses, rings on their lips, rings on their tongues. Are y'all am I right or wrong? Rings on their nipples, rings in their belly buttons. Come on, y'all still here? Rings in some places south of there. Rings on their toes. Rings everywhere, because that's what Babylon does. So when they come back to the house of God, they may come looking like Babylon. Y'all ain't gonna help me preach. And you got the propensity of judging them quickly. Lord have mercy. Okay, let me give you another one. Babylon brands of children. In Babylon, they got marks everywhere. Tattoos everywhere. Come on, talk to me. And some of them are not very kind. They're not socially acceptable because they say some bad stuff. Come on, talk to me. And yet the Lord says, I'm going to redeem Zion. Preach, man, preach. <laughs> Lord, you're going to redeem Zion with all that stuff? What do they do with their tattoos? Y'all going to help me. What do they do with their tattoos? Come on, talk to me. What do you want to do? Have a skin transfusion? Come on, talk to me. <laughs> My God Almighty, is the blood of Jesus greater than a tattoo? Y'all yeah. gonna help me preach? My God, <laughs> hallelujah. I feel like preaching. So we gotta get ready for the redemption of Zion. Yeah. I'm glad somebody is hearing and believing this. This is real, y'all. This is where the church universal is. You don't have to accept it. <laughs> My God Almighty. See, listen to me carefully. I'm very observant. I'm an apostolic strategist, and one thing I have to be by the power of the Holy Spirit is observant. I don't say a lot, but I watch a lot. And I perceive what the Lord is saying. And one thing I observe, listen, it, 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 don't take this wrong. You hear my spirit, not my words only. I noticed tonight, first of all, the mixture. How, how the mixture is predominantly um, non millennial <laughs> I, I'm not knocking it. Glad you're here. Thanks, thanks for coming. Bringing your money and all. <laughs> because that's a good thing about the older generation. They good. They do have more funds. Millennials don't have much money. <laughs> Come on. You know why? Because money is not that important to millennials. Come on, talk to me. The generation before them made money a priority. That generation has not. You're not going to talk to me. I'm telling you the truth. Read about it. Study it. Study it. Find out am I telling you the truth. Lord have mercy. But, but can you handle, can you handle your boys with mohawks? Come on. Can, can they lead praise and worship? Come on, talk to me. With skinny jeans and no socks. Y'all going to help me preach. 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 And who told you that they have to wear socks in order to be a Jesus didn't wear socks. Y'all ain't helping me preach. <laughs> the ladies, and here's why I'm preaching that. The truth is because when they come back to the house of God, where are you going to sit them? <laughs> and they're showing their briefs. And, and now they come with their fashion attire and, and their shirts are at least two sizes small. Because they like wearing them tight. Y'all not gonna talk to me in here. Here comes their women. Here comes their women. Come on, talk to me. We're without support systems. Okay. Y'all got see y'all don't want me to preach. Y'all want me to preach. Oh, have mercy. Hallelujah. Uh -huh. and, and the first thing we'll do is get one of those save me, Lord Claus. Is, Yes. 
Jesus fountain. Come on. They don't know there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. You know why they don't know it? Because you wouldn't see it. Come on. Down in Babylon, they asked you to sing. What was I in song? And you refused to do it. You took your heart and the Lord of Willow Tree and said, How can we sing Zion songs in a strange land? Please, In this text, if I'm going to use a strategy, it would be a strategy called reform. We've got to make some changes. Are y'all still here? But listen to me as I tell you. Some things we've been doing, we've been doing forever without a biblical reason for doing it. Y'all will help me preach. And there's a group of your children and your grandchildren, your nieces and your nephews, Asking the question, why are you doing that? Oh, you know, y'all still here? No, have mercy. <laughs> I, I, I feel like preaching, but I, I, I'm gonna have to quit. Are y'all okay? Listen, I'm about to settle in here <laughs> because they feel like some of the stuff that has nothing to do with your salvation. Come on, talk to me. I know it's the whole choir tonight. I know the whole choir. And I looked around the church. I said, whoa. Not a single woman in here is bare-legged. Everybody got stocking on. <laughs> Y'all ain't helping me preach. Y'all ain't helping me preach. Uh-huh. I am messing with your theology now, and I'm not afraid of you. I got money to get back home. Uh, oh, you, oh, listen to me. Hallelujah. And, and, and it's okay, because you're probably obeying an ordinance. <laughs> but what are you going to do with those who come in who said that ordinance don't make sense? Come on. And you don't have a, you don't have a biblical verse to give them. Why do you have to wear stock in the church and can't come there, lady? You don't have a biblical verse, not a single one. I ain't telling you to stop wearing your stock. Y'all keep on wearing them. Y'all, you be obedient. You got to hear me what I'm saying. I'm talking about what Zion's children Levite. 
according to the text. You just got in from Babylon and already Jeshua and Zerubbabel are making you Levites? You, you, missed, you missed the point. You missed back in verse 2 and 3. They've been to the altar. Oh, they got real quiet on that one. I said they've been to the altar. <laughs> you don't have a right to disqualify anybody who's been to the altar. The decision of the altar is not yours. The days are over when you confirm that somebody has it. Y'all not gonna help me preach in here. No, I had to stay on the altar until my grandmama confirmed, son, you got it. Come on, talk to me. Y'all not helping me preach now, and I'm okay, I'm okay. I really am okay. Matter of fact, the less you help me preach, the more energy I'm getting. You're fueling my fire. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Hallelujah. We used to stay on the altar until somebody verified that you were saved. No, 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 your salvation is my faith that you have. You ain't gonna help me preach. No, and before they were made Levites, the altar had already been rebuilt. So if somebody comes to the altar, I dare you not say they're disqualified. I dare you not say they're not qualified to be who the Lord says they are. They've been to the altar. Y'all okay? I've got children in this category, or just slightly above. My youngest son is 38. He's our praise and worship leader. <laughs> He's got a, a real funky haircut. I mean, I don't even know how the barber does what he does with his hair. <laughs> That's a skilled barber because it's crazy. It's a, it, was, it was wonderful, it's nice and neat and shaped. He keeps it trim, keeps it trim. But it's low on one side and high on the other. And, and it's a semi, what you call those things that they come down the middle? Mohawk, semi-mohawk, yeah, yeah. And filled in with his beard. And the boy, the boy gets in the faith of Jesus. He ushers in the power of the Holy Ghost. But most Sunday mornings, he's got on tight jeans. Not too tight, he ain't showing you nothing. Y'all ain't helping me. He know they have a nice pair of shoes, but no socks. No socks. <laughs> Lord have mercy. But he loves Jesus. He loves Jesus with his whole heart. Now I'm talking, I said he loves Jesus. He loves Jesus. <laughs> but he, his message to a different generation at the church, he speaks to the 13 to 17 year olds. And, and by groves, they, they are one of the fastest growing part of the church right now. From 13 to 17. Lord have mercy. Are y'all listening here? Because they got, they're got getting the teachings of Jesus through somebody they can relate to. I got the wrong. Okay. Okay. I put it up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Paul, we're not going to get rid of you. Please don't get nervous about this message. We're not getting rid of you. We need you around. Come on, you're the wine skin of wisdom. You're the wine skin of knowledge. Come on, talk to me. You're the wine skin of prayer and supplication. We're not going to get rid of you, but you've got to make room for new wine skins. Y'all look up and talk to you. And you can't let them wait until they're 40 and 50 years old before now they at last qualify. You've got to use them while they have strength. If the work of the ministry is going to go forward, you've got to use them while they're young. As I close, they then moved into the completion of the laying of the foundation. Hallelujah. In the laying and relaying of the foundation of the house of the Lord, uh -huh, they began to celebrate the laying of the foundation. Uh -huh. and, and let me just say that many of us as church leaders, and I'm one of them, struggle struggle with anybody messing with our foundations. I said we struggle with anybody messing with our foundations. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> but based upon what foundation went in will determine the size, the height of the structure that can go on it. Come on, am I right or wrong? <laughs> Come on, the architecturally or engineering uh, uh, principles says to us, that is the depth, the density of the foundation would determine the height of the structure 
that can go on it. Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> and some of us have not built a great house unto the Lord in the spiritual realm. Talking spiritually now. Lord have mercy. Because our foundations are too shallow. Our foundations are too shallow. So you cannot build on a shallow foundation a great house. <laughs> if you want to stay in the same location and build a great house, you've got to get an expert to go back and redig and relay foundations. Y'all can help me preach. And that makes us nervous because the enemy of our souls have us in this ego trip like what we've been doing is so right that if we do something else, we must have backslid. Preach, man, preach. Lord have mercy. It's a lie from the enemy. There is a progressive word from the Lord. Come on, talk to me. That's bringing you into spiritual insights that you haven't had up to now. If you close your mind to the future, you'll never have one.